not that long ago, we used to receive gifts and offerings. I don't know if you did it here at St. Luke's this way, but many churches receive gifts and offerings uh, during the service. And, and they used to use a response that actually we used a few weeks ago for our pledge. I'm going to test us and see the more liturgically minded amongst us if we can remember how it goes. So I say, yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the splendor, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. And you say... Oh, 10 points to Gryffindor. That was great. Uh, these verses are taken from the book of First Chronicles, chapter 29. When we say these verses, we are uh, affirming, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit stronger than that, we are um, declaring that God is awesome and great and that everything we have comes from God. Everything. Our homes, our cars, our food, our money, our phones, our computers, our Netflix subscriptions, our wine, our beer, our clothes, our jobs, our education, our status, our family. Everything you can think of comes from God in some way or another. Everything. The question is, do we, do we actually believe that? Do we believe that the very air in our lungs at this moment as we sit here in church is a gift from God? That God in his grace and mercy is allowing each of us to enjoy breath right now. Do we believe this? If you believe it, the question for us then is how do we respond to that truth? Do we look to God who gives all to us, who rules over all, as we've seen in these last few weeks in our series in Daniel? Do we look to him and give him praise for what he has done and humble ourselves before him? Or do we say to our friends and our family, our neighbors, even strangers, look at what I have done. Look at how clever I am. Look at what I have achieved. The God we believe in is a God who raises up and exalts the humble and who time and time again brings down those who are full of pride. And we'll see this in our reading today. Our question from God today is this. Will you turn away from the sin of pride and instead give glory to Jesus? Will you turn away from the sin of pride and instead give glory to Jesus? Please bow your heads to pray. Father God, in your mercy, break our prideful hearts and humble us today that in all areas of our lives we would submit to your lordship and the lordship of your son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and not our own. Amen. Before we go further, I just want to take a moment to talk a little bit about how the book of Daniel, which we've been looking at the last three or four weeks, is structured. Uh, this isn't something we've talked about so far, uh, and we'll mention it in the coming weeks in passing, but for the, uh, the little while to come, sorry. But I thought today it would be good to just flag up how Daniel's shaped. Now, for some of you, this will go right over your head, and you would going to be bored by it, and that's fine. Um, I had some really clever graphics to show you, but they haven't quite worked today, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, for others, this will be super interesting, and you'll geek out on what I'm saying. Now, in our opening talk in this series, I said that the book of Daniel, you might remember, divides into two halves, with chapters one to six being stories about Daniel and his three friends. And that chapters seven to 12, so the second half of the book, are the visions Daniel has in his older age, with chapter seven being a bit like a hinge for the whole book to come together. So at chapter 5, that's next week's chapter, an interesting feature of the book begins to shine through. And this is a sort of mirroring between what's happened so far and what is later to come. So uh, chapters 4 and 5 are a pair that tell the story of two Babylonian kings. The father, King Nebuchadnezzar, which we'll hear about today in chapter 4, and what we've been witnessing so far about him in this book. And then later on, his son, Belteshazzar, in chapter 6. Both kings are warned in a dream or a vision from God, like in chapter 2. And like in chapter 2, only Daniel can interpret these messages from God. Both kings have proud hearts and are warned by Daniel to humble them. But we'll see how this plays out this week and next as we see how the, the two kings are played out in the book. Then in chapter 6, it's a pair of what we heard last week in chapter 3. But this time, it's Daniel who's tested for his right worship of God. Whereas last week, the friends were thrown into the fiery furnace. Next week, we'll see Daniel entering the lion's den. And again, we'll see how a pagan king gives glory to God for it. 
Uh, and finally, chapter 7 is the pair of what we heard a few weeks ago in chapter 2. But whereas in chapter 2, it was the king who was given a dream of future times in chapter 2, it's Daniel himself who gets a vision in chapter 7. And whereas Daniel only could interpret the dream for the king in chapter 2, in chapter 7, it's Daniel that needs a divine messenger to come and interpret him for him. Uh, the final thing to say, if I'm really boring you, about the structure of the book is the language. Uh, now, chapters 2 to 7 are written in an ancient language called Aramaic. So those whole chapters are written in a different language to most of the Bible. Uh, chapters 1 to, and 8 to 12 are written in Hebrew. Now, this might mean nothing to you, but what it says to us who read the text in this way is that it helps us to see that this middle section, 2 to 7, are meant to be read together as a whole unit uh, and reinforces this pairing structure that I've just said. Um, I said, that may be nothing to you, that may be boring, it may be of interest, but I hope it gives a little bit of detail as you explore more and more the riches of this fascinating book as it's preached and as you read it personally um, in your quiet times. With all that being said, let's look at what God has to tell us today from this next chapter of the book. Uh, last week, you remember, as Di preached, we heard the story of the fiery furnace and uh, the three friends who were encouraged to stand firm like uh, Jesus did in the face of persecution. And to remember that no other God can save like our God in sending Jesus to rescue us. Today, we'll see what the right response to this kind of knowledge about God looks like. In chapter 4, we again meet King Nebuchadnezzar in his prime. He is the head of gold, you remember, from Daniel chapter 2. He's shining brightly. His enemies are all in fear of him. His kingdom is established and prosperous. He is the most powerful ruler in the known world, and his son will soon receive the throne from him. Things are going well for our pagan king, and he knows it. But something troubles him. It's a, another bad dream in verse 10. These are the visions I saw while lying in bed. I looked, and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. Under it, the wild animals found shelter, and birds lived in its branches. From it, every creature was fed. Sounds like a good dream, doesn't it? But then a messenger from heaven comes and calls out in verse 13, Cut it down and trim off its branches. Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But... Let the stump and its roots remain, bound with iron and bronze in the ground, in the grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man, and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. I wonder, did you notice a change in the middle of verse 15? That this messenger went from talking about the tree to talking about him. Let him be drenched. Let him live with the animals. The angel moves from speaking about a tree to a person. So this tree, it symbolizes a person. And suddenly, it's not hard to see why the king is so upset, is it? If you have a Bible open, you, you flick back a bit to chapter 2, verse 37. We read this. Daniel told the king, your majesty, you are the king of kings, the God of heaven, has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands, he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. The king dreamed about a tree that provides life and protects the animals of the earth. And the king was told that God had placed all the beasts and birds into his hands. Could he be the tree of the dream? What does it all mean? As before, the king calls all his wise men before him to interpret what he had dreamed. And as before, he ends up with Daniel being the one person who can give the king back his beauty sleep. Remember chapter 1 verse 17 that God had given Daniel the gift of understanding at visions and dreams. After hearing the dream, Daniel is greatly perplexed, verse 19, and the king could see it on his face. And so the king says encouragingly, Belteshazzar, which was Daniel's Babylonian name, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Daniel has obviously come to care for this king who has taken him away from his home. He knew what the dream meant and it terrified him, perhaps, perhaps because he's about to give bad news to the most powerful man in the known world. 
And we know that this king isn't known for his mercy, as we saw last week. Or perhaps, and actually, I think Daniel is terrified on behalf of the king. He has genuinely come to love this king and doesn't want him to come to harm. And we'll see a bit more of that clearly in a moment. And so, cautiously, Daniel explains the dream to the king, verse 22. Your majesty, you are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky. And your dominion extends to distant parts of the earth. But the God Most High has decreed, you will be driven away from your people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven until seven times pass by for you. Until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and give them to anyone he wishes. King Nebuchadnezzar must give glory and honor to God. Yes, he may rule here on earth. Mankind and all the birds and beasts may have been placed into his hands, but they were placed there by the only person who could give them. They were placed into his hands by God Most High. But there is hope for our king. Did you notice that, verse 26? The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Remember back in chapter 2 that God had told the king through Daniel that his rule and kingdom would be glorious. And if he gives God honor, then it will continue to be. So the question is, will he, King Nebuchadnezzar, give God the honor? Will King Nebuchadnezzar acknowledge that heaven rules? Will he acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all things on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes? All things come from you, Lord, and of your own do we give you. There is a sin which poisons us to our very core. A sin that is almost imperceptible. A sin that in public we can very easily mask. In fact, we, c- uh, we can make it look like it's our most righteous, most godly trait. The sin of pride. Ever got a good score on an exam and a test and thought, yeah, I did that. Ever buy something expensive or designer to show people around you that you can afford it? A luxury car, a luxury holiday, designer clothes or jewelry? Ever post a picture of yourself or someone you love on Facebook or Instagram? Ever win an argument and then tell people about your great rhetorical skill? Ever create a piece of art or music or take a perfect photo and say to yourself or others, look at what I achieved. Ever had a job that you were very good at and enjoyed your own cleverness and ingenuity? Ever got promoted to a more senior level or or even started your own business from the ground up and think, look at where I am now. I worked hard to get here. Ever not wanted to invite someone to your house? This is one for me, unless it's pristine. Ever sit in your new extension and think, I made this happen? Ever have people around for a meal and only get out the very best cutlery and crockery? Ever wear clothing that reveals your most admirable body parts? Ever look at your children's achievements, if you have them, and think that you made them successful? That's quite a list, isn't it? And given more time, it could be even longer, couldn't it? Now, a number of you are probably uh, quite distracted right now or puzzled or even angry or maybe feeling a bit guilty. And you might be thinking, what's wrong with posting on Facebook? Or, so what, I drive a luxury car, it's not a sin. Or, I did work really hard to get a job. You have no idea what I've gone through in order to get there. Or maybe, maybe that extension is a bit lavish. Now, before you dig into me, I'm not saying that any of these things are wrong or sinful. They're not. They're not, if our motivation is right. There's no sin in these things if we are humbly giving glory to God for the riches he bestows upon us. There is sin, however, if we are doing these things and others like them whilst thinking, look at what I have accomplished. Look at what I have achieved. Look at what I did. This is a sin of pride. 
and its consequences are toxic. Verse 29. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power for the glory of my majesty? Verse 33. Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. Sisters and brothers, pride is toxic. It is toxic and its consequences can be disastrous for us and those we love. And there is a toxic kind of pride which is suffocating to our walk with God. The prideful faith. When we, as Christians are in church, are proud of some good work we have done or some act of kindness for someone else. When we pray in public or read the Bible in public and think, gosh, did I do well there? When I, as the leader here, preach a sermon and think, gosh, how good was that? When I gaze on the wounds of my Savior Jesus Christ and foolishly believe that my faith is something that I've earned by figuring out that the Bible is true, by Forgetting that faith itself is a gift from God and instead see it as something that I accepted. By thinking it was my own strength and willpower that I turned away from my sin and turned to Jesus. How wretched and broken am I? That the most precious gift I've ever been given, my salvation, is something that I'm prone to believe that I have earned or accepted or made happen in my life rather than a gift from a loving God. Daniel pleads earnestly and boldly with his king, renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being the kind to the oppressed. It may be that your prosperity will then continue. As Christians, we believe in the eternal realities of our future states. Heaven for those who love, honor, and worship God as the king and ruler. And a place we often refer to for all those who continue to live like they are their own kings and queens. Brothers and sisters, I long for each of you to rejoice with me at the eternal feast of heaven forever. I urge each of us to accept Daniel's advice. If there is pride in dwelling in our hearts, then throw it away and crush it. Remove it from our lives. God has given us here in his word and elsewhere a clear message to teach us not to be proud in our own eyes, but to see that everything comes from him as a gift and to give him worship and praise for it all. Pray that God will preserve you if you are sinning in your pride. Share with a brother or sister in church and ask them to pray for you that God will break this sin and keep you in him as he has promised he will. As God sent Daniel to the king with his message, God has also sent each of us who trust him to all the people we live amongst, our friends, our family, our colleagues, our neighbors and students. Do we love them enough to plead with them to turn from their sinful rebellion from God and to repent and turn to him? Will we pray for them like Daniel did, that God turns their hearts towards him as Lord and Savior? Maybe you've experienced the Lord removing some of his blessings because of how you have abused the gifts that he has given you and the power that comes from you. If so, repent and call to him. Renounce your prideful sin and wickedness and acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. Lift your eyes to heaven and know his love and mercy like King Nebuchadnezzar did in verse 34. God sent his messenger Daniel to Nebuchadnezzar to proclaim to him his message. But God has sent us a greater messenger, his very words made flesh. Jesus warns us again and again to turn away from pride and to submit our lives to following God and to love the poor. Look to Jesus, your Lord and Saviour, who, because he was God, committed himself to humbly serving each of us 
you and me, living for us in order to die for us. Because that's what God is like. He is not proud, even though he has every reason to be. He is humble, merciful, and loving. Brothers and sisters, look to Jesus and pray for his powerful spirit to smash any sins and pride in your hearts and to bring you to true and heartfelt repentance. Be drenched in his blood which he poured out for you on the cross and know the restoration his cleansing brings to be called God's daughters and God's sons. Know that you are loved not because of what you've achieved, but because of what Jesus has achieved for you. Verse 37. Praise and exalt and glorify the King of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. All those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Sisters and brothers, in our story we've seen King Nebuchadnezzar turned away from the sin of pride and instead gave glory to the God of creation. The question God asks to us today is, will we turn away from the sin of our pride and instead give glory to the Lord Jesus and give God the glory for all he has done for us? Please bow your heads to pray. Father God, we thank you that in your mercy you have given us this sobering picture of pride and how it can corrupt and taint and destroy everything good. Lord, we thank you for your son Jesus, who though being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped at, but instead made himself lower, being born as a man, so that living a frail and weak human life like we, he would rescue us from the consequences of our sinful pride. Shape our hearts, Lord, that we will always look to you. Humble us and use people in this church family to bring us to humble repentance. And Lord, when we get this wrong, which we do every day, we thank you that our hope doesn't depend on us being obedient or us trusting you but it depends on your son's work for us. Thank you for Jesus. Amen.